Do you ever forget things? Do you ever have things that kind of slip out of your memory? I'm talking about you're introducing people that you know really well and you just forget their name. Do you ever walk into a room and say to yourself, why am I here? Why did I walk into this room? Do you ever find yourself online and you're like, now, what am I searching for again? We forget stuff. Do you ever forget where you park your car? Yes. Do you ever lose your wallet? Heck yes. We are forgetful people. Well, the most embarrassing thing I've ever forgotten in my life, just watch this. My name is Sherry Hilton, and this is my husband, Barry. We were married in September of 1991. Well, we really planned a kind of a non-traditional wedding and that there was no rehearsal dinner, no formality in it. What we had uh, decided to do was get married at a, in an old hotel. And it was supposed to uh, uh, start at uh, 7 p.m. Ed was supposed to, I believe, meet us at the hotel at 6.30. And uh, 6.15, we're all there in our finest and everything. And uh, 6.20, 6.25, 6 uh, where's Ed? There's the drama and the nervousness. The groom is sweating bullets. Also, we call Ed's house, and the phone's busy. We keep calling Ed's house. The phone's busy, the phone's busy, the phone is busy. Uh, finally, your father starts getting on the phone. He starts calling Houston. So he's trying to reach Ed's parents to see if they might know where they are. And probably about that time, somebody came up and told me that we've got a small problem. I couldn't imagine what the problem was. I said, well, Ed's not here. And things start running through my mind. You start to panic because nobody would forget a wedding. So hopefully, you know, you, you, the fear of, was there a car accident? Is there a problem with Lisa? Is there a problem with the pregnancy? I guess probably at that time, a friend of mine who, had, who was the hotel um, banquet director um, was trying feverishly to find Lisa. A, a replacement. She somehow found a jail chaplain. Pretty soon this guy arrives. I don't know whether he arrives in a police car or, or a taxi or how he gets there. But by now, everybody that's coming to the reception is standing around watching this whole deal. Of course, the typical response, the guys are just dying. And all the women are going, oh, my. And, but probably by this time, we had gotten the message that Ed had forgotten. Uh, the minister comes in, and uh, he was a retired Methodist minister, I, th I believe. And he was ancient. He was either very old or potentially intoxicated. We yeah, I thought he was intoxicated. And that's probably the last time we thought, uh, you know, granted, uh, forgiveness was not the first thing that came to our minds, but, but uh, we never felt anything, uh, you know, ill after that point. You know, his sir, in fact, we were not in church the day he did vapor lock several months ago. We had been out of town. So I couldn't wait to get on the computer and listen to the sermon on the tape. I was looking forward to a relaxful Saturday. We had dinner that night and after dinner I said, Lisa, you know what's so funny is we've not had a phone call the entire day. She said, maybe the phone's off the hook. And sure enough, we found the phone that was off the hook. And right when I hung it up, the phone rang. And I'll never forget what the voice on the other end of the line said, words that haunt me to this day. The voice said, Ed, where are you? I said, well, I'm at home. And she said, you're supposed to be at downtown Dallas tonight doing a wedding. And he had done every possible thing he could do after the wedding date, sent flowers to you and his, phone calls and everything else. And he, I guess he's been carrying this the whole his, time. His parents sent a letter to my parents since they had been friends. I mean, the last thing we wanted him to do was feel bad. And it's very important to us and the whole purpose uh, is for us to convey that Ed, uh, that he, he's more than forgiven by us. In fact, there was never anything to, to really be forgiven for. But if there's anything I guess I expect out of this, uh, uh, once the new chapel is done, across the way, uh, my children are currently seven and eight, but uh, I think he owes us you know, at least one free wedding out of this deal. To, it's payback that I'm going to exact out of the deal. Wouldn't you agree? Wow. 
What a story of forgetfulness and forgiveness and on my part, stupidity. <laughs> forgetfulness. I got a question for you. Does God forget? That's a pretty good question. Does our omniscient God forget? The answer is, surprisingly, yes. Yes, God forgets. He doesn't, though, forget like we forget our wallet. He doesn't forget like we forget where to park our car. He doesn't forget like we forget why we walked into a room. God, though, chooses not to remember. God forgets. So what does God forget? And this is, this is some great news. What does God forget? Sin. How awesome is that? God forgets your sin in mind, your iniquities in mind, your shortcomings in mind, your wrongdoings in mind. He doesn't have a case, though, of divine dementia. Things don't escape his cosmic cranium like, oh, let me think when, when Ed really messed up. No, no. God, though, chooses not to remember our sin anymore. But here is the situation in our lives that I want us to, to ponder just for a little while. We forget that God forgets. Say it with me. We forget that God forgets. Throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, God says, I forget sin. Here we go. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. Isaiah, a major heavy hitter in the Bible. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and, let's say it together, remembers your sins no more. How about Jeremiah, another guy? Another major player, Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will forgive their wickedness and will, let's say it together, remember their sins no more. Hebrews chapter eight, verse 12, the apostle Paul, I believe, wrote Hebrews, for I will forgive their wickedness and will, say it together, remember their sins no more. That's amazing. That's supernatural. That's unbelievable. So the only person that brings up the past is the evil one. Yet, what do we do when we're in an argument? Let's say in a marriage. Oh, I forgive you. Oh, it's, it's forgotten, baby. We file it away, don't we? We just file it away and we wait. Weeks roll by, months roll by. For women, years can roll by. And all of a sudden, when they need that, or when we need that, what do we do? It's so funny. It's so fascinating. So on one hand, God chooses not to remember our sins. They're deleted. They're done. Yet. Whenever God has a gift, the enemy has a counterfeit because the enemy loves to dredge up the past. Ed, can you believe what you did last week? Can you believe what you said a year ago? Can you, you don't deserve to stand and speak. You don't deserve to serve at church. Who are you? That's the enemy. Yet we forget, though, that God forgets. And that's, that's some of the great news of Christianity. I mean, that is absolutely unbelievable. God forgets. Yeah, we forget that God forgets. Today, we are going to receive the Lord's Supper, communion. Why did Jesus tell us to take communion? Well, there are two ordinances in the church communion and baptism. Both 
illustrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The guts of the gospel. Forgiveness. That's what they illustrate. They illustrate newness. They illustrate cleansing. The bread represents the body of Jesus because Jesus lived a perfect life. Batted a thousand at the moral plate every time. Never made a turnover. Never fumbled. Totally and completely righteous. He lived righteously, died sacrificially, rose bodily. So the bread represents the body of Jesus. He put on epidermis. He put on flesh and lived amongst us. The wine represents the blood of Jesus. You know, we have this judgment chip in our lives, don't we? Wrongs have to be paid for. We see something. We, we, we read about an event where someone has been taken advantage of. Or, or maybe there's hatred. Or maybe there's racism. Or maybe there's greed or whatever. What do we say? Somebody has got to what? Pay. Somebody's got to pay for that. Someone takes someone's life. Someone's got to pay. Someone's got to pay. Well, we are full of unrighteousness. We're sinners. God saw our condition. He saw the cosmic chasm between ourselves and him. He can't look at sin. He can't wink at sin. He can't say, well, boys will be boys. Girls will be girls. He sent Jesus, the singular, sovereign, sinless Savior to bridge the gap between himself and man. Christianity is God building a bridge from himself to man. The bridge is Jesus, thereby giving us an opportunity to walk the bridge. Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sins, something that, quite frankly, we don't deserve. Yet there's life in the blood. You go to the doctor, get a physical, they do blood work. Well, I'm here to tell you the work was done as Jesus spilled his blood on the cross. Then, of course, he conquered death and rose again. Yet he lived this righteous life. So, so he knew we would have a tendency to forget stuff. I mean, you know, we're, we're fallen and fallible. So we forget that God forgets. That's why he's given us communion, illustrates forgiveness, illustrates what he did on the cross his grace, his love, and then we got baptism. You go under the water, old life. Out of the water, new life. Death, burial, and resurrection. Now these things in and of themselves aren't valuable. As we eat the bread, drink the cup, in and of themselves they're not valuable. But they're valuable because of the value attached to them. I have a collection of artwork for my four kids. A lot of it is like, you know, Crayola crayons and popsicle sticks. They've made things for me over the years and in and of themselves, they're not very valuable. Yet they're valuable to me because of the value attached to them. So when we come to the Lord's table to partake in communion, we need to think, wow, God has forgotten my sin. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was so epic, so complete, so supernatural, so all-encompassing that he remembers them no more. So we forget that God forgets, and that's why God has given us, for example, the Lord's Supper and baptism. But there's something else I want you to notice. We need to remember that God remembers. We need to remember that God remembers. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, now, I, I love this, because Christianity is, is spelled D-O-N-E, as I say around here a lot, done. The other world religions are spelled D-O. This D-O-N-E, done, is what separates Christianity from the pack of the other world philosophies. 
Jesus has already, and I can't even understand this totally, nor can you. He's already died on the cross for our sins, past, present, and future. He's paid for it. Everything you've ever done wrong, thought wrong, no matter who you are, where you are, it doesn't matter. Jesus took that on himself, and only the sinless one, only someone who's totally righteous can do that. Jesus did that. So here's the contingency. The work has been done, the price has been paid, the blood has been shed, the contingency is confession. And many here, you've confessed your sins, Jesus is in your life, he's power washed your soul. Some here, or maybe you're in one of our other environments, maybe you're at one of our prison campuses, maybe you're in Miami, maybe you're in Keller South Lake, maybe you're in Fort Worth, I don't know where you are, Maybe you've never confessed your sins before God. The word confession simply means to agree with. You're agreeing with what God already knows. You're not letting God in on new information. God's not going, whoa, I didn't know you were a sinner. Oh, thank you so much for enlightening me. No, 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 we're agreeing with God. So if we agree with God, if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, sins, our wrongdoings, our moral scorecard with X's all over it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will, say it with me, forgive us our sins. So the visceral vibe of the gospel is this forgiveness and purify us from all what? I can't hear you, what? Unrighteousness. So, I'm made righteous by Jesus. I'm totally unrighteous, yet because of Christ's righteous life and because I came to a point in my life where I agreed with God about my condition, Christ came into my life and I have the righteousness of Christ. That's, that, that's a good place to clap. So let me, let me challenge you to use your imagination just for a second, just for a second. Pretend like I'm God the Father. Now we know the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three. Just for a second, I'm God the Father. And this is the throne room in heaven. So sitting in one chair, you've got Jesus, God the Son. But see, I'm God the Father, so we have Jesus, God the Son, sitting in God's throne room. So God the Father is looking at Jesus, okay? Jesus is there. Guess who else is sitting in the throne room? You won't believe this. I mean, it's gonna shock you and rock you. You. <laughs> That's right, you. You, 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 you. So you got Jesus, and you. Here's a question. I want you to think about this for a second. Who, as God the Father looks at Jesus and you, who, I ask, is the most righteous? Jesus or you? Don't answer, just think about it. Now, I know some of you in a crowd this size are going, <laughs> that is a stupid question, Ed. Who is more righteous? Come on. It's Jesus. Wrong. That's my Trump imitation. Wrong. <laughs> but here's my Hillary imitation. Here's Hillary's laugh. <laughs> but anyway, the answer is, oh, yeah, let me stop. You know who's here today? Nightline, ABC Nightline is here doing a segment on Fellowship Church because not next weekend, next weekend is Spookorama or Rama. The next weekend after Spookorama, November 5th and 6th, I'm doing a series called How to Pick a President. So Nightline is doing this piece on our church and on this election, which is pretty crazy anyway, but. Let's change the subject back 
to the throne room, okay? Back, I'm a little bit ADD. Back to the throne room. We've got Jesus and you. I'm God the Father. Which one is the most righteous? Some of you, I know, are saying Jesus. Wrong. The answer is both. What? Both. Say it with me. Both. What? Yes. If you have been redeemed, if you've been forgiven, if you've been cleansed, if you've been saved, if you've been born again, you, my friend, in the eyes of God the Father, are as righteous as Jesus. Because we have the righteousness of Christ imputed into our lives. So when God the Father looks at you and me, he sees Jesus. That's how complete the delete was when Jesus paid it all on Calvary. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And again, you, there's no way we can understand it all because God's ways are higher than our ways. There's no way, like, oh yeah, I can figure that out. No, we, I can't figure it out. The best minds in the world can. God's unlimited, he's omniscient, we're not. But I'm telling you, that's some good news, isn't it? So if we confess our sins, have you done that? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So practically, practically I should live a righteous life because positionally I have the righteousness of Jesus. Let me say it again. Practically I should live a righteous life because positionally I have the righteousness of Jesus. So positionally, when God looks at you and me, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. Now, practically, I'm to live a holy life. Now, I'm not talking about a legalistic trip. I'm talking about a relationship. The words I use should be an act of worship, even on the football field, even with the staff, even at work, even at the gym, even on the golf course. The words I use should be an act of worship, Righteousness, because I'm living out, I'm allowing Jesus to live out his life through me. The places I go, what I watch, who I hang around with should be an act of worship. That's why we don't come to fellowship to worship. We should come as believers worshiping. Again, it's not some legalistic trip. I love my wife, we've been married for 34 years. I don't do this perfectly by a long shot, but I love her and I do what I should do before God as her husband. I'm not forced to do that. I do that because of my love. The same is true when you say I do to Jesus. You're representing him. You're reflecting him in everything you do, say, touch, and feel. Well, well, Jesus talked about this. I mean, he broke it down in Luke 22. In Luke 22, verses 19 and 20, here's what Jesus said. He took some bread. I mean, a common element. It's common. No inherent value, but the value he attached to it, awesome. He took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this, let's say it together, in remembrance of me. We forget that God forgets. We need to remember that God remembers. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine, and and he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Now, when Jesus was saying this, the disciples didn't get it. They were like, what, what? Bread, wine, what are you talking about? They didn't get it until later after the death, 
burial, and resurrection, they were like, oh, I got it now. I got it. And I'm so happy that Jesus said, okay, okay, I know you got it now, but you're going to forget it, and you need to remember it. And that's why it's so great for us to come together as a church and remember what Jesus did. Forgiveness is throughout the Bible. Forgiveness. Adam and Eve dropped the ball. Forgiveness. Sacrificial system. Forgiveness. The major prophets and minor prophets talked about forgiveness. God forgave his people. Then we have Jesus. Here's how you pray the model prayer, the Lord's prayer. What's at the heart of it? Forgiveness. What did Jesus challenge you and me to do to be carriers of forgiveness? So everywhere we look, it's about forgiveness and ultimately the cross is about forgiveness. So let's worship him. Let's remember that God forgets. Let's thank him for this indescribable gift as we come to his table and think about his life because it's all about Jesus. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of worship. And Lord, I know we have many people here and many people at our different locations. And if you've never, ever, ever confessed your sin to Christ, if you've never given the totality of who you are to him, just, just say this simple prayer with me. Just say, God, I've got doubts and questions, but I've got faith. And maybe for some of you, just a little bit of faith, that's all you need. And just say, God, I, I believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins and to rise again. And at this time, as I agree with my condition before you, I turn from my sin and turn to you. I ask you, Jesus, just say that, to come into my life. I give you all that I am and all that I'll ever, ever be. If you said that, that's the greatest thing that you'll ever say. The righteousness of Jesus has just been imputed into your life. So when God sees you from now until, well, forever, he's gonna see the righteousness of Jesus. There are blocks of us here, and we've made this decision. We're followers of Christ, yet we've hydroplaned over it. We've skipped over it. We've not really thought about it. We haven't really realized that we're carriers of forgiveness and grace. And may this be a reminder of that. So Father, we give this time of worship to you, this time of application. We ask these things in Jesus' name.